Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us from around the world at this WISER panel from COP26. We'll be talking about accelerating climate action through greater inclusion of women in decision-making roles. My name is Michael Liebreich, and we have a tremendous panel. It's led by Her Highness Sheikha Shama bin Sultan bin Khalifa Al Nahyan, CEO of the Alliances for Global Sustainability. We have Dr. Lamia Fawaz, Executive Director for Brand and Strategic Initiatives at Mazda and also leads the WISER initiative itself. We have Mohammed bin Salem, who is the Associate Director for International Affairs at Abu Dhabi Global Markets, ADGM, and Helena Samsio, who's the CEO and founder of Globi and also winner of the Zaid Sustainability Prize. The first question that I have for you, Sheikh Hashama, and welcome to this panel, is you are actually at COP26 now. Could you explain why COP26 is so important for this theme of climate and gender? Firstly, thank you, Michael, for your kind introduction. It is an honor to be here among such distinguished panelists. COP26 plays a critical role in raising awareness around gender parity in climate action for two main reasons. On one hand, these discussions will shed light on how women globally are far more negatively impacted by climate change, whilst also highlighting how with the right support, women can drive solutions. COP20 established the first Lima work program on gender in 2014 to advance gender balance and integrate gender considerations into the implementation of the international climate agreements and conventions. This actually was a turning point in prioritizing girls and women as the most vulnerable gender group, which makes up approximately 70% of the world's poor and helping to identify what is required to improve their resilience to climate change. Subsequent editions of the conference have progressed gender responsive climate policy and action but there's still much more that needs to be done. As a global platform, COP26 gives us the opportunity to spread awareness of the current gender parity in climate action amongst representatives of most countries. Nevertheless, the composition of delegations of the conference is a significant issue. For example, the UK's initial senior delegation for that conference has been composed entirely of men. It's important that when discuss, discuss, discussing issues around um, women, um, that women be part of that discussion with equal opportunities to participate in politics and in such conferences. Thank you very much. Uh, and you've raised already really significant issues, including the gender representation here in the host uh, delegation. Let me turn to Dr. Lamia Fawaz. Dr. Lamia, could you explain to us in how you see the confluence of climate and gender? Why are these not two separate issues? Why are they, in fact, the same issue? Well, thank you, Michael, and it's great to be here today. Um, the lower participation, essentially, I see it, it as one issue, because the lower participation of women in driving climate action and then the, higher, the high number of women affected by climate change are essentially caused by the same core issue, which is gender role bias. If we are to deliver the most effective climate mitigation and adaption measures, as Her Highness mentioned, with the highest social and economic returns, then we must include women in that process. We know that climate change is not gender neutral, 
women and girls are more vulnerable to its effects and pay a higher price, especially in poorer parts of the world, where they shoulder the major responsibility for household water supply and energy for cooking and heating, as well as for food security. Currently, there are 129 million girls out of school. And according to the IMF, average female participation in the workforce is 20% lower than their counterparts, mainly due to lack of access to education. So as we speak today, there are also numerous women heavily involved in innovating sustainable solutions, but the numbers still lag behind men across the developed and developing world. Women entrepreneurs simply have less access to capital funding than men. We must improve women's access to education and capital funding so that they can take control of their lives be less impacted by climate change and contribute to driving climate action. Women would benefit greatly from more programs, like for example, the World's Bank uh, Women Entrepreneurs Finance Initiative, which is helping female entrepreneurs across the developing world set up their own businesses by providing access to $354 million in funding from 14 different governments, including the UAE. So in order to deliver on the global climate action goals, women participation is key. Thank you very much. And you've raised such an important topic there around innovation and around entrepreneurship, because if we're going to deal with the climate crisis, then in a sense, everything has to change. There has to be enormous amount of innovation. And we're lucky to be joined here by Helena Samsio, um, who is one of the leading women entrepreneurs working in the area of environment and climate. Helena, could you tell us a little bit about what it is that your company does and your journey, why it's so important for women entrepreneurs, an area in which Wiser has been extremely active. Why is it so important for women entrepreneurs to be supported and to be included in this process? Yes, absolutely. So um, Helena Samsio, founder and CEO of Globi, and at Globi we collect climate data with drones. Uh, and we do that through the world's first crowd droning platform, which is currently connected to over 4,000 drones in 91 countries. Uh, and the reason that it's important for women to be part of entrepreneurship and innovation is um, that we are addressing diverse issues around the world. And if we're going to address these, uh, address these adverse uh, and diverse issues, we need to be diverse entrepreneurs doing so. And currently we're seeing that within tech, but also in entrepreneurship in general, about 30% of businesses are started by women, but less than 1% of the uh, venture capital goes to female funded companies. And that's a big, big issue because that means that women don't have the same possibility to scale their businesses and scale their impact as, as uh, male entrepreneurs do. So it's something that we, I try to work very hard as a female founder to, to try to change. Um, and yeah, we, we're seeing change happening, but it's, go, it's going very slow. Um, so it's, um, it's a slight increase, um, but it's still a very slow increase. And uh, that's definitely unfortunate. And can you share your, your experience or your thoughts on um, raising money as a venture from, from venture capital? Because we tend to think of um, the enormous progress that's made, particularly around the developed world, around including women in all sorts of economic activities. But in venture and early stage investing, where, where do we stand? Helena, if you could comment. Yeah, no, I mean, it's it, the numbers are pretty much the same, all no matter where in the world you look, you look at. So uh, around 30% of businesses are started by female but less or just slightly over 1% of the VC capital goes to female funded companies. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's a phenomenon that even though policies exist to, to change these numbers, we still don't see the change that, that's needed. Uh, and in my opinion, we need obviously more concrete actions uh, besides policies to, to make this change. Um, and I think that starts very early on um, in education, how we form STEM and tech curriculum in schools, and also how we frame job advertisements so that females are included in applying to these type of jobs, 
how media represent role models. Um, there is a large number of female entrepreneurs out there. They definitely do not get the same attention as, as male entrepreneurs. So it's, it's a lot of actions that are needed in order to change these numbers. Thank you very much, Helena. And that brings me perfectly to our final panelist, uh, Mohammed bin Salem, because he and his work at, uh, at ADGM, Abu Dhabi Global Markets, um, is involved with the, uh, the entire structure of the capital markets, how capital is funneled around the system, including to earlier stage uh, ventures. Um, Mohammed, how do you see the role of those capital markets in addressing these issues? And what are some of those concrete actions that Helena Samsio Sams has, uh, has, has called for? What are some of the actions that you have pursued at ADGM? Thank you very much, Michael, for, for the opportunity to comment on this. And thank you, Elena, for your, for your words on the uh, central role of capital markets. Let me just uh, start very briefly by a word of thank you to the organizers of uh, this panel at Wiser and Master, and to my fellow panelists for uh, the opportunity to join this excellent conversation. In presence, I need to underline this, to, uh, with, uh, in presence of Her Highness Sheikha Shama. Thank you very much for joining us on, the, on, on this panel and for being present at the COP26 with the UAE delegation. Her presence with us is a commitment. It demonstrates a commitment at the highest level. We're talking about policies and the designs of policies that are uh, uh, a big step in, uh, in fostering gender equality. So her presence with us signals the commitment of leadership to the diversity and uh, inclusion agenda commitment without which uh, a lot of the work cannot be um, pursued and concluded. So we have seen, uh, first of all, a lot of progress in the uh, gender equality area. If you look back from the 70s to now, uh, progress has been made at a very rapid pace. I appreciate that the, the issue is not resolved and did not resolve itself by no means, but uh, um, ESG now, I mean, diversity and inclusion is part of a global agenda that is uh, uh, called the ESG at the uh, global level. And uh, uh, capital markets play their roles in covering this agenda. Capital market by nature are here to provide uh, uh, a meeting place for long-term projects and large-scale projects. And they're here to provide this meeting place between demand of financing and supply of financing in the form of investment in uh, every different form, in all of its forms. In ADGM, so uh, the International Financial Center of Abu Dhabi, we are here to ensure that there is a level playing field, but that the rules are uh, applied correctly on the market. And that is uh, three overarching principles that uh, markets remain fair, efficient, transparent, and that they provide investor protection and reduce systemic risks. So what did we do here in uh, Abu Dhabi Global Market to uh, foster the ESG agenda and gender equality? Uh, two years ago, we came up with a sustainable finance roadmap that is publicly available. And in this agenda that we set for our stakeholders, we outline four pillars, four uh, main uh, uh, prongs for development. So one is the development of a regulatory frame framework applicable to sustainable finance. What we want to have here is uh, a certainty of legal outcomes. So we ensure that the, the applicable law is the uh, uh, UK and Wales uh, uh, common law directly applicable to Abu Dhabi global markets. And that the regulatory framework that is developed with this in mind allows for uh, fairness in participation of all our stakeholders. The second pillar is cooperation. When we develop, when we develop this framework, we did so with all our stakeholders at the national level. So these are the government, Ministry of Climate Change was involved, uh, Ministry of Economy and uh, Ministry of Finance. We uh, worked with uh, all the stock exchanges in the UAE. Uh, we worked also with all the regulators. We want also on our third pillar to develop knowledge and awareness. And this type of, uh, of uh, action and panels uh, are part of this uh, uh, efforts we're developing. But most importantly, what we try to put in place here is what we call an ecosystem. So that stakeholders uh, coming here have all the supportive cooperative elements to uh, thrive in this sustainable finance hub. So maybe I single out one single project that you will hear in the next few weeks, 
we have been working with a lot of stakeholders on what we call a sustainable finance platform. So basically it's a website that will gather together in an easy to digest format and in a comparable format, all the data that is publicly available on sustainable finance when it comes to listed companies in the GCCs. So with more transparency and more accessibility of data and comparability, the aim here is to have all our stakeholders have access to the same data, situate themselves in uh, among the stakeholders undertaking the same uh, type of work and help our investors to make more informed ESG decisions. So uh, also one of the big themes here in Abu Dhabi and uh, I join Elena and his and her excellent uh, startup on uh, on um, uh, sustainable data and, uh, and drone deliveries, where we, what we look at is facilitating the uh, reaching of a sustainable finance objective by uh, uh, the ease for business for innovative um, fintechs and accessibility of finance. So uh, we have a digital reg lab here that gathers together a lot of uh, fintechs some of which are developing and they are in the pipeline developing uh, uh, sustainable finance related projects and uh, watch out we have a few uh, things that hopefully will be uh, announced in the next few weeks uh, or month so what we believe in a nutshell to summarize it is that what we invest in today will shape our future and we are uh, in engaged in the effort of having a sustainable future that we would facilitate the financing of here in ADGM. Thank you, Mohammed. And you've raised uh, two very, very important points, among others. One around data and the availability of good, transparent data, and you're working on that. And the other point you made was around the ecosystem of stakeholders, ranging from government through to the investor community, the finance community, the business community, and the entrepreneurs. And it's tremendous that we have those stakeholders here in this panel, including a great champion of the private sector uh, and their engagement in the environment and in climate. Sheikha Sharma, you have been such a powerful voice for the private sector through your uh, alliances for global sustainability, and you're here at COP. Could you talk about the role of the private sector in driving through change on these twin fronts of gender and climate? The private sector is essential, especially given its central position in the trifecta of government, business, and individuals. We've already seen how effective it is to have the support and compliance of the private sector in carbon offsetting the adoption of sustainable practices and gender balance. Now imagine what we could achieve if businesses started correlating all three. Also important to look, for us to look at how the various tiers of the private sector can work together in achieving these goals. So it's not just about the multinational companies, but also SMEs and startups doing their part. It's about creating opportunities for collaboration to maximize impact. And Helena, to that point of maximizing impact, how do we help more women to have more impact in frontline communities and coming through the system as entrepreneurs? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a very important, important uh, issue to address. And um, I think, first of all, um, feeling included and feeling that you're part of the solution is, is key. Um, so when we do talk about technology or yeah, tech or STEM in general, um, it's important that, that girls and women also feel included in that and that we widen the scope of you know, what really technology is. And I think this starts very early on in in school, as part of the school curriculum, how is uh, technology and STEM being taught in school? Who are the teachers? What are the diversity among the teachers, and how that is how that is educated? Um, and then we see a big issue when it comes to um, 
job jobs in tech and STEM. Uh, they usually portray images of middle-aged white men doing the work. And if you want to attract uh, a more diverse pool than that and attract females uh, to, to, to these type of jobs, you need to show that representation. Um, and the same also with, with media, there is a number of very successful female entrepreneurs out there in the world and they get very little airtime compared to males. So there is a big, big, uh, big changes are needed on, on many different components, but the one of the biggest ones that are needed is obviously the venture capital um, fundings. Um, we cannot have 1% going to female funded companies if we expect them to be able to, uh, to scale and, and be able to scale their businesses and scale their impact. There has to be a change in that. So there is uh, a lot of things that needs to be, uh, be done. And yeah, the numbers are going, going in the right direction, but they are, they are going too slow. Uh, and obviously me as an entrepreneur, I'm, I'm always impatient and I want things to move faster. But uh, in, this, in this regards, it really has to. Um, we are all needed to, to create that change that we need to see. And it needs to happen now. We cannot wait. Um, so there is, uh, there is definitely uh, steps that need to be taken in this, in the, in this direction. Thank you very much. Absolutely. And Mohammed, could you speak to what the impact of greater women's involvement uh, in decision making across the board, uh, that if we can improve that, uh, that involvement, that inclusion of women, more women entrepreneurs, more women running businesses, more women in government making decisions, more women at COP uh, in the decision making, the negotiating forums, what impact would that have on the ecosystem and, and on the macro environment and on the sorts of uh, companies and financial markets that you're involved in? Yes, indeed. Thank you very much, Michael, for, for the question. Uh, uh, the idea that uh, having a greater participation of women to uh, the economic uh, productivity, but all through uh, the cycle, it starts with education. Elena mentioned this earlier. It's continuing with policy. It goes uh, on to investment deployment. Uh, Elena uh, outlined here the roles of VC and their disproportionately um, disproportionate allocation to uh, uh, to uh, the male operated industry rather than uh, female led uh, industry or companies and employment as well. These are these are very big themes that uh, that needs to be addressed. There are many, many reports that outline that there would be, for the greater society, a positive outcome if women were to participate at a, uh, at a higher uh, level or at par with uh, men in the productive cycle of economy and from education to, uh, to uh, employment and entrepreneurship, of course. Let me maybe uh, single out that D during uh, COP26, uh, uh, many NGOs have uh, done incredible work in trying to quantify this adverse impact of policy and lack of participation of, uh, of women in the productive cycle. But one particular star uh, statistic is, uh, is striking. There was an IMF report that uh, uh, quantified uh, through, uh, through a statistical uh, hypothesis that if we raised women uh, representation in the labor force to the level of men, then we would have a jump in GDP uh, in the United States by 5%, in Japan by 9%, in the UAE 12%, and in Egypt 34%. So uh, gender balance is not only an ethical good thing to do, but rather it's the right thing to do in terms of business, productivity, and GDP growth. So uh, just a smart thing to do. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, those are fantastic statistics or impressive statistics that show at the macro scale just how important this issue is. Um, Dr. Lamnia, if I, if I can come back to you, um, the UAE has really been a pioneer and quite certainly a pioneer in uh, the GCC region on including women in education, in business, in finance, in government and so on. Could you speak to some of the initiatives uh, that have been pursued at the UAE and uh, perhaps some that you've been promoting through WISER? Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely, Michael, thank you. So, I mean, I think it's not news to many of us, but the UAE has put gender parity front and center of its climate change or the climate mitigation agenda. 
including its pledge to achieve the net zero by 2050 and making it the first Middle East and North African country to do so. And thanks to our wise leadership, climate action has been an opportunity to grow and diversify our economy, creating knowledge, skills, and jobs to empower women and young people while contributing practical solutions to global problems that affect us all. Maybe if I can also comment on the UAE bid, the UAE's official bid to host COP28 in 2023 also came with a clear statement to the world that the UAE views gender parity as inseparable from climate action, economic growth, and the success of COP28. And as you may know, the UAE's commitment to gender parity is not new. It has been instilled in the country by the late founding father of the UAE, His Highness Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan, who believed that women had a significant role to play in the, in the country and in the economy. And inspired by his ideals, the UAE leads the region in its support of women and has many achievements to show. Some that I can tell you recently are being ranked number one in MENA and 24th globally in the 2021 Women, Peace and Security Index, topping the World Bank's Women, Business and Law Index for the Middle East and North Africa region, ranked first regionally in the 2020 UN Development Program Index on Gender Equality, and maybe even more prominently, one of the initiatives that has been announced and spoken about all over the world is for the first time ever, Expo 2020 Dubai created a dedicated women's pavilion showcasing the central role women have played throughout history. And I think a big important part of this, and we are fortunate to have so many powerful female role models who every day inspire women and girls to reach their full potential. One, of course, which comes at the beginning of all of this is Her Highness Sheikh Fatma bint Mubarak, the mother of the nation. She supported countless women through her tireless work. And this year, she also launched the first national action plan on women, peace and security helping to empower women by building their skills and capabilities in all sectors. Also, Her Highness Sheikha Manal bint Mubarak, uh, excuse me, Her, Her Highness Sheikha Manal bint Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, through her role as president of the UAE Gender Balance Council, has been instrumental in the UAE having a parliamentary body with 50-50 gender ratio and closing the gender gap across all government sectors. I mean, the achievements of UAE are so many. We can look at in education, 70% of all university graduates in the UAE are women. 56% uh, of UAE government university graduates in STEM fields are women. Women make up around 80% of the scientific team working on the Emirates Mars mission, which is again, a science-based uh, science uh, role that is usually mostly led with by men. So these are just some of the many initiatives. WISER, as you may know, also has many initiatives that we've been working on to support women to become leaders in the clean energy and sustainability sector, supporting them, supporting entrepreneurs, ensuring that they're prepared to be leaders in the future. Thank you very much. And you know, those statistics that you gave of all of those, the most impressive one is the fact uh, that in the UAE, more women are graduating in STEM subjects than men. And I don't know if there's anywhere else in the world that that can be said. Uh, Sheikh Hashama, you have also been involved in a number of initiatives around including more women in decision-making. Could you talk about some of those initiatives? I've been involved in, in, in several initiatives, but one of the projects that I'm most uh, proud of is, uh, is a social enterprise that I co-founded in 2020, where we work with leading Middle Eastern organizations to accelerate gender balance in the boardroom. We have brought on some incredible partners from both the government and the private sectors to support women in advancing their board careers. Last year, um, ESCA, our regulators, mandated that every listed board should have uh, a woman, a woman uh, on, that, uh, on that board. And so we're very proud to have 
played a role in in those discussions and also in preparing those women uh, and also identifying them uh, for those positions. At the moment, uh, we're in discussions with various entities to establish a Women in Sustainability Initiative. This is my next project uh, that will support women in the sustainability space, but I'll share more about it uh, at a later stage. Thank you very much. Um, we are reaching that point where we're going to start wrapping up our thoughts on gender and climate from here at COP26. Um, if I might, I want to ask each of the panelists whether they are going into the early days of COP26, optimistic or pessimistic that these agendas, uh, these twin agendas, gender and climate, will both be advanced during this COP, this COP summit. I'm going to turn first to Helena Samsio. Helena, optimistic or pessimistic? Well, again, as an entrepreneur, you have to stay optimistic or at least what I like to say, possibilistic. So there is definitely a, an opportunity to, to change things around, but, uh, but action needs to start and uh, needs to have started yesterday. So let's hope that it comes out to and become more action oriented than we, what we have seen in the past. Thank you very much. Uh, Mohammed. I love that concept. Optimistic or pessimistic? I love that concept, possibilistic. That's exactly the word, I didn't know it before. But the idea here as a, an international financial center, we have to remain optimistic, of course, and we have to foster the possibility and foster the existence of a level playing field. So uh, this is what we do, this is what we dedicated to with passion. Now, whether COP26 will close all the chapters of the negotiation, well, uh, let's remain positive and uh, hope for a great outcome. But Obviously, we're late. It should have happened yesterday. Elena mentioned it. We're late on uh, the targets that um, that uh, were set by the previous COBs, and uh, and let's see now if we can close chapter by chapter and uh, uh, and move uh, the needle at our level, each one of us in our uh, respective fields. Whether that be entrepreneurship, whether that be uh, 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 policy development or market development whether that be uh, fostering this ecosystem with initiatives such as uh, Women on Board with, uh, uh, led by Sheikh Hashama. These are all going in the right direction. We need to move faster, obviously, but uh, remain totally optimistic. That's tremendous. And um, the, uh, the word possibilistic is going to enter my vocabulary as well. The great economist Paul Roma talks about optimism. And what he says is we have to be optimistic, not like a child waiting for a marvelous birthday present, but op optimistic, like a child who's looking at a tree and sees the possibility of building a tree house. It's active optimism or possibilist possibilism, we're now gonna call it. Um, Dr. Lamia, what about you in summary, opt optimistic or, or pessimistic? Well, of course, optimistic and with uh, actively being optimistic, I think climate change and gender parity are defining issues of our time and they're interchangeable. So to, to realize the other sustainable development goals, we must also achieve gender parity. And I know and I, or I believe that this is not gonna happen overnight, but it must be tackled through an ongoing collaborative and inclusive approach, which I believe many of us will be pushing forward as years come. So definitely optimistic. Thank you very much. Sheikha Sharma, you are at COP. Uh, you are in a position to be actively optimistic or possibilistic in your uh, activities at COP. Could you just share with us uh, very briefly what sort of outcomes are you hoping to see? I believe that we should always have hope. Um, and I've met a lot of people. I've... Uh, I've seen that there is willingness to change. I've seen it in business. I've, I've heard it from, from, from different governments. Um, my view is that we need to have a tangible and actionable roadmap. We need to be clear on our objectives, but more importantly, 
how can we work together to make the change happen? Thank you very much. And um, what a great note to end on. We have to move from optimism to active optimism, that possibilism. We have to move from that to concrete and tangible actions. That's what we're here for here at COP26. And with that, we conclude this wiser panel on accelerating climate action through better, in better uh, involvement and inclusion of women in decision making. I'm Michael Liebreich. Thank you very much for spending a little bit of time with us. And thank you to our wonderful panelists. Thank you.